so that was Bach's Goldberg variations. He didn't originally write them for a string trio, but they, I think they work really well. Uh, and you can really hear the individual voices, probably, I don't want to say better than on a piano or harpsichord, but just differently. And you get to hear things that you may not normally hear. Uh, now we're going to skip to uh, Schubert, actually. Um, the third piece on your, on your program is his string trio in B-flat. Uh, he wrote three string trios. Uh, there's this one that's actually only, he only finished the first movement. The second movement, I think he only wrote about 30 measures and then abandoned it. Uh, there's another one that he did complete uh, It's fabulous. And then there's another one that he also started, wrote about 30 something measures and didn't finish it. Uh, these p trios he would have played with his family. Um, he had already written all the great string quartets, the Schubert, like Death and the Maiden and things like that. So he was trying something different. And um, so he, he would have been playing the viola, actually. Uh, so I kind of like that uh, as a violist. And um, it's a great piece. I will be playing. It's only a single movement. It's from 1816. And uh, it's uh, an allegro, so a fast movement. Enjoy. <laughs>
Schubert, even though the cello and the viola do get the melody, sometimes the violin really has uh, the, most of the melody. And that was not by accident. That's how it was uh, back then. The, the treble voice would have the melody, and then the other voices would accompany. And I think, uh, but already in Schubert, you start hearing uh, more independence of the voices. Uh, and I guess if you take it to the extreme, when you're the, the first piece you heard, the Bach, wasn't written for string trio, but really there, each voice is as important, we're all of equal importance, is really uh, just breaking apart a, a piano score. So uh, Dohnani, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna play two movements from his Serenade in C major, uh, opus 10, so it's an early work. Um, somewhere I have the year, it's 1900 something, early 20th century. Um, it starts with a march, Allegro march, and then we're gonna jump a few movements ahead to um, a theme and variations. And, and what's great, when we get to the Beethoven, I'll point out how it, it actually, I think Doc Nani was imitating Beethoven, at least in style and the form, because it's a serenade, the Beethoven that we'll play for you is also a serenade. It also starts with a march. It also has a theme and variation. So I think there are just too many coincidences for uh, for that to have been an accident, I think. Mm -hmm. So for now, enjoy a serenade in C major, opus 10 by Erno Dochnani. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. So now on to uh, Beethoven. Beethoven, uh, we all know Beethoven, and we all know his string quartets. Uh, Opus 18 were the first set, and then he wrote quartets pretty much for the rest of his life. Uh, but before he wrote the quartets, he wrote string trios. Uh, his Opus 9, there are three trios, uh, Opus 9. Um, and you know, and again, the, the, the string trio was, uh, Mozart has, has a divertimento for string trio, but there, there wasn't a lot of examples of, of this instrumentation uh, then. And you wonder, you know, why, why did they write so many string quartets and not as many trios? And I, I think, at least to me, it's perhaps the, the four people, it just gives you more voices to, to play with. But what I love of playing in a string trio is, uh, is we're, we're one of each. There are now two violins, so Shijan over there is the only. Oh, by the way, let me, this is Shijan Tsai on violin. Thank you. And on cello, we have Feng Cho. Thank you. And you know me already. Um, so, so yeah, it's just it's it's so it's such an intimate uh, form of music making. Something that I think, uh, th th you know, the the string quartet when you play a string quartet, it's a little safer because you have more people to rely on. But here, sometimes you're just hanging on your own, and you know, you have just this thin accompaniment. It's just it's just beautiful. So it's at least for me, and hopefully for you guys, uh, it's ju it's just a different thing. So Beethoven, going back to Beethoven, uh, Opus Nine, and I'll tell you what year he wrote it. Once I find, I believe it's over, it wasn't even the 19th century yet. It might have been uh, where is that? Oh, 1799. So yeah, so I think he was 28 years old when he wrote it. Um, Hmm? What? It's not in the program. It's not in the program. It's I guess that's it. we took the Mozart out and inserted Beethoven. I figured hopefully you don't. I mean Mozart's great, but Beethoven's cool too. You know, it's not, you in the program. Oh no, it's my notes. Okay. I I wrote notes. Uh, thank you. Good eye. Good eye. Um, so this one and the reason I was saying earlier that it relates to the to the Dachnani. They're both serenades, and. Uh, they both start with a march, even though we will not play the, the march at the beginning of this, because it, it's same as the Bach, it's framed by an aria, the theme, all the variations, and then the theme at the end. Uh, the Dachnani does that, and it has the march at the beginning, then the theme and variations, and then had we played the fourth movement for you, even though it's its own thing, at the end, the first movement comes back, it's like bookends. And, uh, and Beethoven starts with a march, there's several other movements, and then he has this theme and variations movement that we're going to play for you. And at the end, you'll see the movement doesn't end. You could never play this movement by itself because it just stays like hanging like, <laughs> and with the expectation that you're going to play the march. So we will not play the march at the beginning, but we will play the theme and variations. And then we'll segue to the march. And, and then we get to the end and you clap. So <laughs> uh, thank you. I mean, you don't have to, but we appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. 
It's very physical, uh, more so than Mozart and uh, Schubert. Um, you know, Schubert has to sound effortless. Mozart's the same thing, has to sound effortless, but Beethoven has muscles. I don't know. It's, it's just <laughs> different. Yes, it's oomph, exactly. Yeah, oomph. Um, our next and, and last piece is actually um, not that old. It was written in 2013 by a local composer uh, who's our composer in residence, Caroline, uh, Carolyn, no, Caroline, sorry. <laughs> it's been a lot of notes, Caroline Maloney. Um, she lives here in Buffalo and she's wonderful. She's written many works for us. This one was not written for us, but uh, we have played it uh, before. And uh, so it was written in, in 2013 and it was actually, it was a commission, I forget who commissioned it, out of town, but she wrote it while here, while living here already. It's called Clock It. And uh, the name Clock It, it's supposed to be uh, a reference, uh, you should think of Clock It like a sports, you know, timing, so there's a fast energy to it. But also Clock It sort of rhymes with a hocket, and I don't know if you know what a hocket is, a hocket. Uh, in music, but I don't know if it's another, I don't think li there's a literary hocket, but in, it's when you take uh, a melody or a line and you break it up between different instruments. So imagine a line of people and each person says a uh, syllable. <laughs> and together, if you're very coordinated, it might even sound like one person talking. Uh, in our case, it's three instruments uh, you'll hear at the beginning, and for a while we're actually playing the same note, but it just, each instrument has its own timbre. Uh, so it's kind of cool, it's a really cool piece. Uh, so thank you and thank you to WNED for hosting us, We're much appreciated. And thank you everyone for coming. And I, I think there's a Q and A at, afterwards or whatever, that, that's looking forward to that. So uh, we'll be with you in like seven minutes or so. So <laughs> you can clock it. <laughs>